still email it to you, no, but no, I, no, I printed no. it. And that's, that's even nicer because so I don't put it in my when I was, files. I felt so stupid you asked me to do that, and I went, she had, oh, wait, and she asked me to do that. I forgot oh, that thing. Don't worry about it. Well, I, I do get kind of, not at, not at people, at me. That's what I, I meant. Sorry. You only have a million things to do. I don't know why you can't get it done. <laughs> No, I, I don't have anything to do. What are you talking about? <laughs> 500 and 501. 500 and 501.
Praise Mark 197. 197. We are in a series of lessons similar to David Letterman's top 10, if you remember anything about the Letterman show. And we've been looking at, for the last few weeks, these harsh scriptures. Now let's define harsh scriptures in the context in which I am intending. We are not talking about the fact that they are not hard to understand, that is, they're not hard to figure out. They are pretty simple. They're pretty blunt. They, they get to the point. There is no controversy as far as people when they read the book, but there is a problem we have with them. We looked at, at the outset of this study, we looked at the first one being Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. Jesus was not really serious when he said, love your enemies, was he? Jesus wasn't serious when he said, pray for your enemies, was he? Jesus really wasn't serious when he said, treat the way you want to be treated. Or in the words of Matthew 7 and verse 12, as you would want people to do to you, do so to them, for thus fulfill the law and the prophets. We paraphrase it. I kind of smile and laugh at people when they get mad about paraphrasing the Bible. But they're just as quick to tell you, what does the golden rule say? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, that's paraphrased, but it's still biblical. And he wasn't really serious, was he? I mean, he really wasn't getting, at, really wasn't telling us that we have to do that to our enemies, right? Yes, he was very, very serious. And yet, how does he expect me to do that? How does he expect me to, to do those things? Well, he tells us in verse 48, Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect or complete, you be complete. Follow the Father's way. Follow His will. Then we looked at Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28, something you and I take for granted almost because we've accepted the fact that Jesus, we, we observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. We, we know very good and well He wasn't talking about His literal body and His literal blood, but there are people that have a problem with that. Why should I take Jesus' blood and His body and eat them. Because Jesus said, if you don't do that, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Now, there are some people that think that we're cannibals. In fact, the first time I ever heard it was, was about 30 years ago. Well, we're not cannibals. And I went, well, I never thought we were cannibals. And something that I was taught from a very early age, something I, was, I still accept today, but it's hard for people to understand. And what we understood was is that as long as we are partaking of Jesus, then we have him. And the symbols that we have, or the, the, the institution is called what we today call it the Lord's Supper. I've never found it in Scripture, but we, we adopted that from Leonardo da Vinci, where they're sitting at a table, which they never were sitting at a table. Luke tells us they were reclining, and, and so they were doing that. And so... We, we looked at that and discussed that, how we are to not only memorialize the Savior, but to also examine our lives. That's the point of the Lord's Supper. That is, we remember his death till he comes, and we examine our lives and make those adjustments because that's what Jesus did on the cross. He enabled us to do that and to be reconciled to it. Last week, we looked at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And, 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 and it almost sounds like that was a waste of a sermon, was it not? Because, gee, come on, Dwayne, God is the one we can trust the most. But isn't it ironic? The one we can trust the most is the one many times we trust the least. And the reason is, is because he didn't really say Matthew 5, 43 and 40. He really didn't say, uh, he really didn't mean things that he taught, did he? 
mean, for example, when when the Pharisees, when the Sadducees walked to to in Matthew 22, and you know they made up that whole facade, nothing they believed in, by the way, when they were telling that story. And Jesus said, "You err, not knowing the Scriptures." Verse 39 and 40, because. There's not going to be marriage. There's not going to be given in marriage. There's not going to be that. And yet, what do we have being told to us today? At the end of seven years, whether it's a pre, middle, or post-tribulation, everything is going to be in a utopian society here on earth, and we're going to marry, we're going to have children, we're going to have... Jesus said, that's not going to happen. But he didn't really mean that, did he? Did he really mean that? Yes, he meant that. And so the one we want to look at tonight is in the very last few verses of the book of Revelation. Turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. And what John, or what Jesus says through John is really, really simple. But history has taught us. Christians have taught us. This isn't always easy to follow. And the reason is, is because we tend to want what we tend to want. Now, the devil has used for the last 50 years, 50, 60 years, he has used a piece of legislation which should have been passed. It should have never had to be passed. But I'm talking about the civil rights legislation in 1964 in which everybody has been given equal rights. Doesn't matter if you're, what your creed is, doesn't matter what your religion is, doesn't matter what your skin color is, doesn't matter who you are. If you're a U.S. citizen, you have inalienable rights. The Declaration of Independence said that. The Constitution guarantees rights. In fact, no, nothing in the Constitution or the Constitution itself would have never been passed had it not been for the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that we call the Bill of Rights. There were actually 12, believe it or not, but only 10 got passed. And so, so in the last few years, we think we're entitled to everything. I mean, we're entitled to know this and we're entitled to know that. You don't know how many times because I don't know how many times you've been asked this, but you know how many times I've been asked private information that wouldn't, first of all, make any difference in a situation, and second of all, it wouldn't make a hill of beans. I have been asked by members of the church when somebody come forward, well, what'd they do? Well, what do you want to know that for? I don't even know what they did. That, that's between them and the Lord. But they want to know information. Well, we grew up with it in the 70s and the 80s, did we not? With the concept and the idea that inquiring minds want to know. The National Enquirer was famous for that. I don't know how in the world they ever had enough money to pay for all the lawsuits. But they got around a bunch of them by saying a close source said that Patrick Hart was at church, at the Bayer Church of Christ on September 13th wearing suspenders. Well, you and I know he's wearing suspenders tonight because we see it. But we are entitled to know everything. Now, I use that personally and, and, and to, to try to figure out what might have been, not that I'm going to add to anything, not that I'm going to take away. I've already given the sermon away, I know. But, but there are things in Scripture that I'm just so curious about. For example, what happened to Jonah? What, what ever became of Jonah? I mean, what, why didn't God explain to Job why he suffered the way he did? Job went to his grave not knowing why the things happened that he did. But he didn't, and, and I know somebody will pop up, well, you don't need to know that. The Holy Spirit didn't, I know that. But here's where our problem becomes. Our problem becomes that we think that God doesn't know what he's talking about. That God doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Is that not what the children of Israel did most of their existence the first 40 years? 
I mean, they wanted to know this and they wanted to know that, and then, then they got so deceived into thinking that they had it so good in Egypt. I never read they had it very good in Egypt when that new Pharaoh came to power. I read where they had it pretty good when Joseph was alive. But Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 says, Now Israel, listen to his statutes and judgments, while I teach, which I teach you to observe that you may live and go and in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you. You will not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 30, verses 5 and 6, the words of Agur. Every word of God is pure. If people would just accept that, if people would just listen to those first few words, if Christians would listen to those first few words, man, we wouldn't have things going on in the church today. Nothing is more destructive to the cause of Christ than, than someone who just doesn't like something. That is their opinion. You know, uh, we, we can't have, uh, in, in fact, I told a guy one time about, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm unscriptural tonight, and I've been unscriptural for a long time because I have a brown imitation leather Bible. That is a cover. And, and I don't have white pages, but I will tell you, I do have the golden gilded pages, and so I'm, I'm scriptural about that. But I have another one at home that's got silver pages. The Apologetic Express should repent because they put that in silver gilded pages. And they put it on white lettering. And, and, and I had a guy one time, and, and he was upset with me because I was using an electronic Bible. Well, I don't want anybody to stumble and fall. But he, he just kept on, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. I just don't like it. And so because Romans 14 and Romans 15 teaches me that I have to be the mature one, and I was, and I still am, I turned around and I said, okay, I won't use it anymore. But let me ask you a question. Why do you not bring your Bible to church? Why do you not, well, I can hear, I can hear better. I can participate better. Well, let me tell you where the, the objection to the electronic thing was. It came from the fact he didn't read anything. <laughs> it came back to the idea he didn't read the Word because he was not nice about it. He was cruel about it. And so I asked him, and I confess, this part I, I messed up on. But I told him, I said, so do I have to bring a black leather edition? He told me I'm being ridiculous. <laughs> uh, now, opinions are one thing. And, and you don't have to agree with opinions. I mean, for example, I have opinions about things that I know nobody agrees with. And that's fine. I, I can come up with all kinds of conspiracy theories. But here's the problem. The problem comes when Jesus said, don't add to the words of this book. And I turn around and I say, well, you know, I, I don't really like the way he put that. I really don't like what he taught. Well, let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 7. Let's go to Matthew 7. And, and, and I will tell you, this is the most frustrating scripture for me in all the Bible. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. I, I will tell you, it's not frustrating because the Lord lied. It is not frustrating because the Lord didn't tell me the truth. It's not frustrating because I don't want to read it. It's because I don't really like the idea. I don't want this to happen. But what did Jesus say? Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, Jesus didn't really mean all that, did he? He didn't mean all that, did he? Isn't that cruel? Isn't that just absolutely cruel that he would set up a way, that he would go about and setting up a way that was against people? Wait a minute, you got something wrong there, Dwayne. You got something wrong. 
You're promoting human way. You're promoting world way over God's way. And this is the bottom line. For example, why, did, why was there no such thing as instrumental music before 606 BC or 606 AD? I had a couple of friends of mine. I asked them, I said, why do you think, because they were, they were ridiculing me big time over the fact that they had an Alan Jackson CD and they were playing it and playing Precious Memories and all that stuff. And, and, and again, I emphasize friend. And he turns around and he says, see, he likes that song. He just doesn't like the way it's being done. I said, that's right. And I asked them just to test them out. Why was there nothing said? Why was there no instruments of music, even in the Catholic Church, before 610 A.D.? Well, we didn't have them. I said, what do you mean we didn't have them? There was, they weren't invented then. I said, you forgot David was running around? And playing instruments and music, and, and by the way, the book of Amos said God tolerated him doing it. He didn't approve of it. And, 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 you're, and you're telling me that we didn't have instruments and music? I guarantee you we had instruments and music ever since, nearly ever since the world began. But that's really not a, now, now we have the new teaching. That's not a salvation issue, is it? I mean, come on. Just because, just because we we just put a piano, a, a, an organ, uh, just because we put a drum in there, just hey, that, it's, that doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Oh, really? Then why was the very first thing God addressed in the book of Isaiah was their worship? They put in paganism. Why don't you just add a little bit to what's going on? There's no harm in adding it, is there? Go to Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis 3. I want to show you, is there any harm to adding anything? Is it a salvation issue? Genesis chapter 3. I'm indebted to Charles for something he told me years ago, and I use it frequently. You can't have it back, by the way, Charles. Ah. But in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, do you think he knows Eve's weakness? <laughs> if you don't think he knows Eve's weakness, then you better wake up again. You think he knows your weakness? Absolutely. Do you think he knows my weakness? Oh, does he ever. But look at Genesis 3. Here he is. The, he's more cunning than any beast of the field. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. You shall not touch it lest you die. You know she added something to it? Now, I know it's inferred in the text. But God never said anything about touching it. He just said, don't eat it. And what is the one word Satan used? What's the one word Satan used? And Charles told me about a preacher that he was here years ago by the name of H.L. Matheny, and he called it the knot in the tail. The N-O-T. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not touch it, nor, sh nor you shall eat it, nor shall you touch it, sorry, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day of you, that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, 
here's where Satan told a half truth. And a half truth is better than, than no truth, right? I mean, a half truth is better than a lie, right? <laughs> no, a half truth is a lie. You're going to be like God. In other words, we put it like this in 2020 terms. You're a threat to God. And when you're a threat to God, what God said didn't make any difference. Now you read the rest of the chapter, you know already what's going to happen. God goes through and he talks to, she gives it to Adam and they, and they both touch the forbidden fruit, both eat the forbidden fruit. And by the way, the Bible doesn't say it was an apple. I had somebody the other day saying it was an apple again. No, it doesn't say that. Probably was. I don't know that it was. But we have artists that have contributed to that. And when he asked Adam, and he asked Eve, where are you? That's not a physical question. That's a spiritual question. Because do you think God didn't know where they were? I mean, he's the one that created them. He's the one that created them. And so here he is. And they said, we went, we heard your voice, and we were naked. And God said, did you do what I told you not to do? They didn't answer. God knew the answer. He made them clothes. He cursed Adam by having to work by the sweat of his brow. He cursed Eve with two ways. She's going to be uh, have pain and childbearing. And then, then the other way is the desire for her husband. That's not a sexual desire. That's a desire to control. And I don't know of any time in history where that's not been some type of problem in the church. Now, one man said years ago, at home that he never wanted to be an elder of, of our home congregation. He says, because women are in control too much and they don't know what they're, what they're supposed to do. And how he made people mad. But you know what? He was right. He was absolutely right. Doesn't mean they're supposed to be under your thumb. That's not the point here. But they need to know their place. Now, Women can preach today. Oh, wait a minute, I, I shouldn't have said it that way. Because, um, and the, the reason I said it is because there's a lady that's very popular in the country. Her name is Joyce Meyer. And she gets very offended at the old traditional scripture of 1 Corinthians 14, 34. She gets offended at the scripture of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Both of those scriptures say, Women cannot take an active public role in the corporate worship. Doesn't mean they can't have a role. Doesn't mean they don't have a role. Doesn't mean they can't teach. Doesn't mean they can't do things that, that men can do up to a point. And yet she thinks that what that has to do with is that men have said for years that women don't have the ability to do anything. My wife is 10 times as smart as I am, not because she's sitting on my pew back there, but she is 10 times as smart as I am. She is brilliant in so many things. I have no issue with that. But God set a pattern, and it's God's rule. Brienne gets harassed by someone that, that she sees from time to time, and they'll get into a religious discussion, and he's always saying, you know what I don't like about the Church of Christ? They put down women. And she says, when? She says, I've never been put down in the church. <laughs> and and, and he, he'll try to go through and explain, and she says, that's because you don't want to do anything. And by the way, a guy by the name of Jim Conway wrote a book named Men in Midlife, or the book's called Men in Midlife Crisis. And that's what the church is still experiencing in some places today. Men won't do what they're supposed to do. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative is nothing gets done. That's what should happen. But, you know, well, you know, well, women can do this. They can serve on the table as long as they don't leave prayer. If you think this is not happening in the Lord's church today, wake up. Um, the, the, and, and, and I told you a few weeks ago about, about a man that I worked with in South Central Kansas about leading prayer. And so he, he said, well, let me think about it. 
and I wouldn't hound him, I wouldn't hound him, but every once in a while he'd come back and he said, you know, I don't think I can do that. And I said, I said, I think you can. I think you can. And he says, well, let me think about it some more. I said, go ahead, take your time, bro. He got so excited that he decided he was going to do that. And so he told me, he says, I'll leave the dismissal prayer this morning. And I made the mistake of saying, Brother McPherson's going to leave the dismissal prayer. And the next thing I know, he's, he's trying to get enough courage up already because it's coming time for the dismissal prayer. I could see he was kind of sweating it. And I didn't want to put pressure on him. And, and before he could speak and got enough courage to speak, a woman started leading that prayer. He walked up to me after church and he said, don't you ever ask me to leave prayer again. And I said, why did you do that? Well, he doesn't like leading prayer. And you called on him. I said, what you don't know is, is that we've been having this discussion for about six weeks off and on. And he finally got the courage to lead a prayer. I said, it doesn't have to be long. Don't worry about making mistakes. The Lord knows your heart. But you turn around and now you have closed the door of him ever partaking and, and participating in the worship service other than just sitting there. Well, I shouldn't have done that. As though that just took care of the problem. <laughs> but there wasn't any harm in that, was there? There wasn't, I mean... Why did you make such a bit? Why did you go talk to that woman, Dwayne? You shouldn't have spoken to that woman about that. You shouldn't have said anything to that woman about that. Why not? The book says I was supposed to. Yeah, but don't we live in more modern times? Don't we live in more modern times? Aren't we a little more advanced? I mean, you got Joyce Meyer that preaches, then you've got... Paul of White that preaches, and, and you've got all these women. They're very talented. Hey, I have a, a schoolmate, not a classmate, but a schoolmate. She's very talented in doing Ladies' Day presentations. And because of the pandemic, they haven't been able to do that, but she's very talented in that. Now, can't she just participate in the corporate worship? The answer is no. Can she make comments? Can she say stuff? Sure. And by the way, you can get into this big old fight and argument with somebody that, that doesn't want to agree with you anyway. And the point is, don't add to what God has already said. Is that not what the children of Israel did in Numbers 13 and 14? I just can't get away from Numbers 13 and 14 very easily. God said, I'm going to take I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm going to give you houses you didn't build, crops you didn't plant. And so they go in the book of Deuteronomy and they ask Moses to ask God, can we have permission to go and spy out the promised land? And they go, and what did they say? It's everything God said, but what they said was God lied to us. Oh, it is a land indeed flowing with milk and honey. Here's some of the produce. But we can't take the promised land. You know what the problem is? They, they didn't include somebody in the we. They said we can't take it. Caleb and Joshua, Caleb quieted the crowd. And said, if God is for us, I mean, we can take it. He used words, Paul probably used words and adapted them from Caleb. You know, Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? And they went to take stones, to stone Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and Aaron. And then what did they do in the later part of the chapter? When God said, get out of my way, Moses, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the map. Oh, they went and did a makeup. They're, they're going to go and fight. You know, they got caught, so they're going to go make it, make this up to God. Moses said, why are you rebelling? 
Why are you rebelling? You're going to lose. And they did. They did. And for 40 years, they only got to see the promised land. They never got to go to it. Only two that left Egypt got to go to the promised land. Now, God didn't say there's going to be anything if you add to the book, did he? Look at what he says in Revelation 22, verse 18. If you add to the words of this book, God will add to you the plagues that are written in this book. Number 16, when God, when the people complained and the people whined and rebelled after Korah's bunch and they start whining and complaining in chapter 17 that you killed the people of the Lord. When in reality, Moses didn't have anything to do with that. What happens? There's this plague that starts going through. This plague that starts going through. Moses tells Eleazar, you better get the censer. And when you get the censer, you put, fill it with fire and you, you tell Aaron, run through as fast as he can. I don't know how old Aaron was. He had to be in his at least 90. <clears throat> but he's running through. And by the time Aaron can run through, fifth, almost 15,000 people died that day. You got the 251 from Korah and the 250 people that lit the censers. You got the other people from, from uh, Dathan and Abiram. And they didn't have to die. If we'll take God simply at his word, we won't have to die either. And of course, the second thing he says, don't take away. Don't take away. Now, God really didn't mean things he said in his word, did he? I mean, he really didn't mean things he said in his word. I mean, come on. This book is so old. I mean, here is, here is Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. And they're offering fire before God. Oh, I left something out, didn't I? They're offering, the King James called it strange, but it's profane fire. It is not fire God authorized. But fire is fire, right? Fire is fire, right? I mean, one fire is as good as another, right? Wasn't that what happened in 2 Kings 5? When Naaman just wanted to be healed of his leprosy and when he, he doesn't even see Elisha. He never sees Elisha, which insulted Naaman in the first place. And when Elisha tells him through Gehazi, go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. That's all you got to do, be healed of your leprosy. Can I use in water just water? Aren't the waters of Abana and Farfar just as good? Well, you know the answer to the question. The answer is no. Can I just do that? Now, Nathan, Naaman must have been a very good man. He must have taken care of his soldiers and taken care of even his slaves. Because even one of his, it's, it's a slave girl from Israel that tells him about this prophet that can heal you. Then one of his servants comes up and says, if he told you to do something great, you've done it. All he's asking you to do is the simple. Now I can just picture this. I can't prove this, but I know people. He did once. He did twice. He did three times. He did four times. I'm sure by this time, Naaman is like, you've got to be kidding me. This is not working. I thought maybe what would happen is it would eventually 
get there. Now I know that that, that probably didn't happen or, or it doesn't report it in scripture. But you know something like that's got to be going through Naaman's mind. Five times nothing. Six times nothing. And I personally believe, and it doesn't matter what I believe in this, Naaman said, well, what have I got to lose? Do it a seventh time. And what happened? His leprosy turned into baby skin. But you see, Gehazi got greedy. And Elisha saw him the whole time. And Gehazi runs after Naaman and says, oh, my master changed his mind. So he, he, he wants to change the garments. And, 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 and Naaman just poured things on. And Gehazi went and hid it. Elisha said, uh, what'd you say? Oh, I didn't, I didn't say anything. He said, you lied. The leprosy that Naaman had is now on you. And he was placed outside the camp. For the rest of his life. Now God didn't mean that, did he? I mean, God didn't mean anything that he said, right? Simon was, a, was obedient to the gospel, the magician. And he sees what Peter and the others are doing, and he walks up to Peter. I'm gonna tell you how dumb Simon was. It, and I say dumb in the sense that we're just as dumb as he was. He walks up to Simon Peter and he says, I want to buy this power. Give me this power. Sell it to me. Now, I like the way Peterson in the message puts it. He says, to hell with you and your money. And, and, and the, the traditional says, you have been poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Here's why. Here's the dumbness. You thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. A gift is not a gift when you purchase it. And God would have given it to him. He just chose not to give it to him. And so Simon says, pray for me that these things will not happen. And apparently Peter did, and apparently Simon repented, and the church flourished. The church flourished. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with Simon wanting to buy the power of God, was there? I mean, he was trying to be honest and sincere. The first sin in the church was what? Lying. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. There wasn't anything wrong with them lying to God, was there? Lying's a good sin, isn't it? The answer is no. There was everything wrong with it. Because they didn't lie to Peter. They didn't lie to the people. They lied to God. And what did God do? God killed them. I said that one time years ago, and I had a member of the church walk up to me and said, God did not kill them. God doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> we went back and read it, and she was shocked that God killed them. Here's why it's so imperative. What's the consequence? If you add to the words, God will add to you the plagues that are written in this book, and then God will take your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. It breaks my heart, and I mean it, to know there are people out there that buy into Satan's lies, and one of those lies that they buy into is that you cannot lose your salvation. They call it once saved, always saved. And I'm like Kevin Fox. I wished it were true. I wished it were so true that, that I could go do what I wanted and what I wished. And by the way, the people that teach the doctrine don't even agree with what the doctrine is stating. In fact, I talked to about four of them and they, they can't agree, which simply means 
their doctrine is confusing. And God's not the author of confusion. But you see, one of the things that people don't know about Billy Graham is that Billy Graham taught for years and years. Once you're saved, always saved. He always loved to use Acts 16, 31. Believe on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. He loved to use Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you'll believe with your heart. And, and what that boiled down to was you just believe there's a God and a Jesus and you're fine. But his wife, Ruth, developed a terminal disease. Unfortunately, she went into remission. But before that, he told his wife and he told people close to him, I have not taught what I should have been teaching. You see, I should have taught that baptism was essential for salvation. And when his wife got well, you never heard much about it anymore. And there are people who still do not believe that baptism is essential for salvation. But you know what members of the church have been deceived into thinking? That baptism is all that's necessary for salvation. I have, been, I have watched many a member of the church teach their kids, and it's great what they're teaching, that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. And that's true. But folks, that's the start of it. That is not the end of it. And those same individuals that are teaching, that have taught their kids that baptism is essential, do not come, do not pray, do not study. Use people as an excuse not to do what God says. And, and I just, I get scared to death for them. And I mean this. Because God is not going to stand on the day of judgment and say to me, now Dwayne, why didn't you go to church anymore? Why didn't you pray? Why didn't you remain faithful to me? You see, I didn't do it because old Brianna over there offended me at church one Sunday. Jesus told us it is impossible that no offenses should come. We, we don't pay attention to that one very well, but we do pay attention to the second one because woe to the one for whom the offense comes. It would be better for a millstone to be hung around his neck. You see, that means you when you offended me. But I got a question for you. Did God offend you? Did God offend you? Or did he die for you? Did God offend you? Or did he love you? Did you listen to the devices of Satan? And did you buy into the idea that God will excuse every behavior that is sinful, and that he owes you eternal life. You see, that's what the Pharisees thought. That's why he said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we prophesied in your name? Have we cast out demons in your name? Have we done many wonders in your name? And then I'm going to declare to them, Depart from me. I'm going to use the King James Version here. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And if John 17, 3 is right, eternal life is in knowing him and knowing the one he sent. And 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 9 says, if the, the eternal punishment comes to those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you know God? Do you know God? We're going to sing 197 this evening as a means of encouragement tonight because you see, that's what this all boils down to. Oh, I, I, I know the Bible is true. I know the Bible is right. I know the Bible is, is everything. You know, some people are just like a friend of mine said one time, that book's old. You know what? It's new every time you tell the story. If there's some way we can serve you tonight in your walk with God, please let us do it while we sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way.
384. We're going to sing the first stanza, a little bit different tonight, 384, first stanza 384 to give those who were not able to be with us this morning an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. 384, first stanza. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Father, we thank you for the many wonderful blessings of life. We thank you, Father, especially for our life in you. We thank you, Father, that Jesus came to do what no one else would or could do. We thank you, Father, that he has, by his life, taught us what we should do. One of the things we've been commanded to do is to remember our Savior. We do these things in remembrance of him. We also meet in thoughtful reflection about our lives. When we think about the broken body, Father, it must have been extremely extremely difficult to watch. But Father, we know that you knew what the end was going to be. How you'd have many more sons to be perfect, that is to be complete before you. And at this time, Father, we think about the bread, Father, which is to our minds, our Savior's broken body. That when we are broken, we can repent and you will mend us. It's in Jesus we pray. Father, our minds go back to that day that we read about. And Father, we, we don't read about the bad things that happened to your son much. There are a lot more things we know about from modern medicine and people that have written about it. But we know it was about to bring agony on our Savior. We know he sweated like drops of blood. Father, we know that through prayer he, he was strengthened and he was ready to go to his betrayer. And he was ready to do what no one else could do. And yet, Father, we don't understand all the aspects of love. We don't understand what our sins did to you and what they still do today. But we sure do understand a little bit because of what it costs your son and you. And Father, we realize that we can have the forgiveness of sins through what Jesus did, and not only because of what he did, but because of his resurrection. Because now we have a life. And please, Father, help us to live in a way that pleases you. And because of what Jesus did by offering his blood, we now can ask for the forgiveness of our sins, for which we do. It's in Jesus' we sing some songs that you just can't quite sing. <laughs> but can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? <laughs> um, goodness gracious. Went out of my head what song I wanted to use. There's so many of them that I love dearly. 442. As we go out this week, may we remember that our faith is what's going to be the victory. Yeah, we need our faith strengthened, and so glad you're here tonight. Thank you for what you have contributed to teaching me through your through participation in worship. Four hundred forty.
42, and then I'm going to ask Patrick to dismiss us in prayer. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be whole. church here. Father, again, thank you for your son. And 